Hey, it's Sunday morning, June the 27th. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Selgersburg, Indiana. I'm Brother Steve, the pastor. And for some time now, we've been looking at some of the blessings that God has just given us. And we began by looking at the idea that in Deuteronomy 6, the children of God were given the land of promise. And when they inherited the land of promise, he said, I'm giving you cities you didn't build, houses you didn't fill, wells you didn't dig, wells thou diggest not. And I think there's a great promise in that, that God is providing for us. And we've looked at several of the modern equivalents that God has just given us as blessings. And this morning, I want to share a, a, a simple thought or two about what I believe is one of the greatest blessings God has given us, and that's prayer. Now, I want to be real honest that there's just no way I can exhaustively cover the topic this morning. And my goal this morning is just to try and look at maybe one of the one of the major issues or something about prayer that I think maybe answer a question that might be on your heart. And I just want to take a few minutes today and and remind you that that there is okay to ask questions. And the question that I'm often asked by people, specifically younger kids, newer Christians, since God knows everything, why should I pray? It's a good question. God does know everything. He is all-knowing by definition. He knows the outcome of things before they start. But yet he gives us the freedom of choice to pray. So why should we pray? Now look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, one of the more familiar verses in our New Testament. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, listen to me, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Doesn't God already know it? That's a great question, isn't it? You know, prayer is really the greatest Christian privilege, but as many would admit, I'm afraid, it may be the greatest Christian failure. All of us need to learn to pray more and to pray better. I don't know all there is to know about prayer, but I know I can learn more and I can pray more and I can pray better. Can I be real honest with you? I didn't know all there was to know about marriage, but I sure was happy to get married. I didn't know all that was involved with it. I didn't understand how I could love her more. I didn't understand how we could grow more close and how we could uh, live a life together and how we could uh, work together and, and how we could grow a home and how we could enjoy the aspect of married life and how we could uh, grow together that way. I didn't understand that that I would be spending the rest of my life. I didn't really know what that meant, but I got married with great joy and excitement, hoping to learn every day how to be a better husband. And I can tell you something, friend, and you need to hear me. Just because you don't understand prayer is no excuse not to be a prayer, not to pray. I think there are a lot of questions but I think we need to be careful that we don't let our questions and our thoughts about prayer hinder us from praying. We all believe that prayer impacts our families, our nations, and our world. And in these critical days, I think it's important that we understand the importance of prayer. Now, let's look at the early church, if we would. Jesus has just ascended, Acts chapter 1. Jesus has left his disciples. He has, he has risen from the dead. He has commissioned them to go into all the world, and then he ascends back to the Father. Notice what happens as we look at those early chapters and those early stages of the early church. In Acts chapter 1, verses 12 and 14, we see this. They returned to Jerusalem. They went back to the upper room and they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. You know, even a casual reading of the book of Acts would confirm to us that totally and uh, with all their being, the early church, the early apostles, the early disciples, they depended on prayer. They absolutely believed that prayer was not optional. They dared not make a move without surrendering it to prayer. They didn't make decisions without bathing in prayer. They sought God's guidance. They sought God's presence. They sought God's answers through prayer. We see that continues in Acts chapter 2, one of the more familiar verses, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. The early church understood the vitality of the apostles' doctrine. And listen, doctrine is extremely important. We are a people who have a confession. 
We believe the word of God teaches us how we can find everlasting life through the one and only means of salvation, the Lord Jesus. We love fellowship. We love the breaking of bread. We're looking forward to this fall when we can start having meals more and we can start doing things more, Bible school picnics and stuff. We love that. But they continued also, the Bible says, in prayer. May we be found to do that. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John go up together to the temple when? At the hour of prayer. Now you can say, well, that was a Jewish tradition, but they made it theirs. They made the priority of prayer. Sometimes we have prayer meetings and there's very little prayer. You ever tell somebody you'll pray for them and totally forget about it? You ever click praying for you on social media and forget to pray for them? Is if God only acted in response to your prayers. How many of your friends would be Christians? How many of your friends would have gone through healings? How much of your world would be different today if God only acted in response to your prayers alone? You know the worst prayer? The unsaid one. Look again in the early church. They continued fasting. And the doctor, the doctor and the fellowship, the breaking bread and prayer of the apostles. Peter and John went up at the hour of prayer. In Acts chapter 6, the Bible says, we'll give ourselves continually to prayer. In Acts chapter 12, prayer was made without ceasing within the church of God. They worked alongside the Lord for three years. The disciples saw Jesus' miracles. They heard his teachings. They saw him touch people. They saw him resuscitate people. They saw all that Jesus could do. They saw him die. They saw him resurrected. They saw him ascend. And the most important thing they did following that was pray. That's amazing, isn't it? They saw Jesus. They worked with him. They loved him. They touched him. They heard him. And when he ascended back to the Father, they made prayer a priority, as you and I should. Too often we grieve the loss in our life, but we fail to pray. Perhaps we should grieve our own prayerlessness more. Why should we pray when God already knows our needs? Why should we tell God what he already knows or ask him what he already wants to do? You know, I think there's some great questions in that. First off, again, let me remind you, you don't have to understand everything about prayer to be a prayer. We understand there's some important reasons that we should pray, but let me first off suggest there are a couple reasons why we don't pray. All right? We don't pray to impress God. We're not the people that believe in just in much speaking, whether it's crazy or this or that. You know, uh, Shakespeare talked about uh, much words that say nothing, and we all know those people who can talk for 20 minutes and say nothing. Do you understand the importance of not trying to use flowery words to impress God? Listen, God knows you. God created vocabulary. God understands who you are. And if you try to impress the people around you by your prayers, you're certainly not impressing God. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us we're to cry out to God and speak to him as a heavenly father. We're to cry out, Abba, Father. We're, We're to place ourselves humbly under him in prayer, submitting to him, certainly not try to impress him. And I'm also amazed at the number of people who pray in a way that you think they're trying to inform God. You know, now, now, Lord, as you told us over here in chapter 4 of Acts, da, 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 God knows where that verse is. Who are you trying to inform? Uh, Lord, uh, you may not remember, but my cousin Vern's in the hospital. Uh, God knows where your cousin Vern is. We don't pray to impress God. We don't pray to inform God. And we don't pray to, um, I want to say this carefully, to entertain others. We don't pray to impress others or to inform others either. Our heart's desire and our prayers ought to be to God. Now, if we voice a public prayer, we need to voice it in a responsible, respectful way, acknowledging the situation, the needs, the hurts, the wants. But we're not trying to pray to impress others. We don't pray to inform God. We don't pray to impress God. But so often people pray like they're trying to teach somebody else, you know. Now, Lord, the people on the other side of the room don't understand that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Yeah, they do. Who are you trying to impress? God, God wants us to pray for very important reasons, 
but he doesn't need us to impress him or to inform him. He doesn't need you to try and impress others or to inform others either. Notice carefully, though, we do pray because we do want to invite God to be a part of all that we are. You know, when you ask God to visit with you and you ask God to hear you, dear Lord in heaven, I, I'm asking you to come into my situation. Lord, I'm hurting today. My child's hurting. My, my family's hurting. Lord, my spouse is hurting. Lord, I'm going through trials and troubles. Lord, I need you to come alongside me. What we're doing is we're inviting God to be an important part of our life. Let me give you three, I think, important priorities that when we do pray. First, when we pray, we experience partnership. We become workers together, according to 2 Corinthians, with God. When we pray, God gives us joy and the privilege of, of walking with him through his kingdom affairs. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But we work with him and he works with us. Now listen to me, we can't do it without him. He can easily do it without us. This is a blessing for us to come alongside and agree with God that he's in control, that he's the Lord God of creation, that he is the master of the wind. He's the maker of all things. He's Lord God sovereign over the universe. He's involved himself in the affairs of men through his providential care. And he wants you to come along and partner with him and talk about it in prayer. Lord, you know, I'm broken today. I've got a friend who's hurting. God knows that heart, but he just wants to hear you say it. We become partners with him as we work together. One of the other principles of prayer is it helps us in our discipleship. It helps us to grow in Christ. You know, uh, oftentimes we pray and we don't receive the immediate answer we're looking for, or something happens that we didn't ask God to, to do it the way we thought we wanted God to do it. But God takes those circumstances, and through the discipline and the discipleship process, He grows us to be more like Him. You see, we get to partner in His kingdom. We get to grow in His image. And then thirdly, I think this is real important. When we pray, we experience fellowship with him. God never wants us to live our lives independent of him. When you invite him into your life, when you ask him into your heart, when you ask him into your soul, when you become a born-again believer, you enjoy fellowship with God. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God is within us as, as the earnest, the down payment of what heaven will be like. And we experience fellowship with God proving that God doesn't want to leave us or forsake us. So the fellowship we get to enjoy is because God doesn't want us to be independent. He wants us to be a part of his body and his kingdom. One of the worst things that happens when you run into a Christian who's so dried up and so miserable and so independent that they don't need God anymore. You see, we don't pray to impress God or anybody else. We don't pray to inform God or anybody else. You know what we pray for? We pray to invite God so we can be a part of his partnership in our lives. God invites us to be his partner. We, we, we have the invitation from God and we invite God to help us grow through discipline and discipleship. And we accept that invitation of fellowship. Walking with God through the day. Look how beautiful that sunrise is. Oh, thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, that, that person looks like they're hurting over there. Lord, just speak a word of peace in their life. That, that intimacy, that communion with God is so vital. There's nothing worse than a self-absorbed, self-centered, independent person who claims to be a Christian. That is an oxymoronic situation. You cannot be independent and be born again. We become dependent on him for fellowship and for passion and for intimacy, for strength. And it's in that prayer time that we find that we become more like him. We understand his heart better. We understand his plan better. We have compassion like he has compassion. We have boldness because he gives us boldness. The more we spend time with him, the more we look like him, the more we act like him, the more we become like him. And isn't that our goal? If you're a born-again believer today, your goal is godliness, Christ-likeness. Prayer is one of the most important disciplines on the journey. Let me ask you today, when was the last time you spent more than five minutes in prayer? 
Hopefully you're praying without ceasing. And I understand that principle, but there are times of intentional prayer that we need to have. I have used for many years the uh, word pray as an outline for prayer. Praise, repentance, anybody, anything, and then finally yourself. So we begin our prayer time with praise, acknowledging the fellowship, acknowledging our dependence on him. We repent because we want to be pure before him and we want to let his holiness be a part of us and we don't want our sin to interfere with our communion. We share our petitions with our family, our friends, our world who's hurting, our missionaries, the needs we share, the burdens we have. And then we talk about ourselves. So many American Christians in particular are so self-absorbed and self-centered. When they pray, it's just all about me. We need to start with praise because God is worthy. Find cleansing. Pray for others than ourselves. Some people prefer the word acts, A-C-T-S, adoration. Again, we praise the Lord. Confession, again, repentance. Thanksgiving, really spending time uh, with a gratitude of heart. And then supplication, praying for others and yourself. I don't know that it matters exactly how you pray but be a prayer. God has given us this well, this blessing, this incredible privilege to commune with him, to partner with him, to be discipled by him and disciplined by him and to fellowship with him. Let's make the best of it. The most important prayer you can pray is that prayer of trusting Christ to be your personal redeemer and savior. Have you come to that place in your life where you've repented and trusted Jesus as your Redeemer? Go to our website, if you would, fbc-sellersburg.org, and there's a link there for the gospel. You can send us prayer requests. You can send us questions. We'll be happy to help you. You can email us there. You can reach us. We, we want you to grow in Christ, but we want you to know Him. I want to challenge Christians. Be a prayer. Mean it when you say you're praying for people. Live it. Fellowship and commune with him through prayer. Now, Father in heaven, I'm just asking that you would take these bigger words. Help somebody to be more like Jesus is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you.